and welcome to the Royal College of Physicians for this curator tour of our major anniversary exhibition, This Vexed Question, 500 Years of Women in Medicine. My name is Kristen Hussey and I'm curator here at the RCP. And I'm Bryony e. Hudson, I'm guest curator of the exhibition. This year, 2018, marks our 500th anniversary. That is five centuries since we were first founded by King Henry VIII in 1518. So we've had an exciting year of exhibitions, events, and other celebrations to mark this occasion. And this is the last of our major temporary exhibitions in which we wanted to explore one of the more challenging parts of our five centuries of history. That is the story of women in medicine and the college. Uh, but it's not just an important year for the College of Physicians. It's quite a monumental year more widely for British history. It's been 70 years since the NHS was first founded, 100 years since the end of the First World War, but also 100 years since a limited number of women were given the right to vote. And these were all important themes that we wanted to touch upon in this exhibition. Should we go and take a look? Yeah, let's do it. We took the quotation for the title of the exhibition from an 1870 letter written by a male medical student in Edinburgh who recognised that women aspiring to be doctors was forever going to be a vexed question. He was responding to an event known as the Surgeon's Hall Riot when Sophia Jex Blake, um, one of seven women trying to qualify as doctors in Edinburgh, were prevented from taking an anatomy exam. And we really like the quotation because we wanted to focus on the debate that women working in medicine has provoked through the whole five centuries, whether they're working as apothecaries, as midwives, as surgeons or as physicians. And we also wanted to make sure that we highlighted both the known pioneers, but also many of the women that visitors would perhaps not have heard of before and have been more hidden in the sources. So the exhibition starts with a range of women who played different roles within medical history and we had to begin with Dame Margaret Turner Warwick who was the first woman president of the college in 1989. Interestingly, she felt that gender had no place to play in debates about medicine. In contrast, we have a pair of miniatures. They show Lady Jane Baker and her husband Sir George Baker who was royal physician to George III. We know next to nothing about her, but we do know that the wives of physicians were vital in the success of their husband's career. And then we also have uh, Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin, who uh, was a laboratory chemist. She was a medical woman, but working in research, and she won the 1964 Nobel Prize in Chemistry again showing that there's this range of roles that women could play that perhaps on first sight you might not consider. In 1907, Sir Richard Douglas Powell, who was president of the RCP, said women ought not to be encouraged to enter a profession for which they are constitutionally unfitted. Now, that's quite a shocking sentiment for us to hear now, a little over 100 years ago, someone from the College of Physicians saying. But it's important to remember, for the first 400 years of its history, the College of Physicians was a major player in excluding women from medicine, even though they, of course, do fantastic work supporting women doctors today. Now, when the College of Physicians was founded in 1518, they had the power to license doctors in London and for the area seven miles around. That meant they had the opportunity to say who was and wasn't a doctor, who was in and who was out of medicine, and women were definitely out. And they used these powers to license doctors in order to imprison and fine irregular practitioners, including women. So we have here in the case a bond for Elizabeth Pratt, a woman who was brought before the college for practicing medicine in 1709, and they actually sent her to Newgate Prison. She had to sign this bond saying she would never practice medicine again. Although, of course, things in the past aren't always quite so clear-cut, we also came across the case of Alice Leavers, who in 1586 was brought before the college for practicing medicine as a woman, but they actually allowed her to continue to practice medicine tacitly because she had a royal patron who interceded on her behalf, Lord Hunson, who was Queen Elizabeth I's um, Lord Chamberlain. 
Things didn't change for a really long time, though, at the College of Physicians, and we have here in the case some fascinating letters from Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, Britain's first female doctor, asking the college to change their ways over the whole course of the 19th century and pushing for the admission of women to the college. But they actually didn't make a change for Elizabeth. Uh, they didn't change the regulations until 1909, and when they admitted their first female member, Dr. Ivy Woodward. We were unfortunately unable to find an image of Ivy, even though she's so important to the college's history. So we asked an artist to represent what she may have looked like to sort of recapture this hidden woman of history. And finally, we were able to identify an image of our first female licentiate, a slightly different category of membership, Dr. Dosabai Patel, who's shown here with her classmates at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And it's really fantastic to be able to bring her back into the story. As we've already seen, women were excluded from formal medical practice for most of the period that this exhibition looks at. But that doesn't mean that they weren't both experienced and knowledgeable practitioners. And of course, that was mainly in the home where they were the carers for both invalids and children. We have an amazing collection in the College of Recipe Books, which is where this knowledge is often captured, um, both handwritten ones and later published ones. Um, and occasionally, through these publications, we get a glimpse of a woman um, with this level of expertise. So we have an example here, the Countess of Kent, who, as an aristocratic woman, was not, ab not only just uh, able to develop her, her medicinal skills, but to publish them, including the Countess of Kent's powder, which in the 17th century became very popular, including some of these rather weird ingredients, crayfish and pearls. She would have developed this experience it, probably in a still house, a special space within her estate where she could um, carry out what were almost chemical experiments. But for the majority of women, they're working within a domestic sphere, and that continues through these recipe books into the 19th century, perhaps the most famous um, being Mrs. Beaton's book of household management, which advises women um, definitely on medical areas as well as other domestic ones. There's a chapter called The Doctor, which features an illustration of a medicine chest very like this one, giving advice to women on how to treat people within the home, but also when to bring in a doctor, when to bring in a man as an expert um, in a case where women weren't able or weren't seen to be able to carry out um, that work. And the idea, the stereotype of woman as domestic carer, of course, continues today as it has done in previous centuries, the assumption being that they will be the primary person responsible for medicine within the household. If you ask who was the first British woman doctor, I think most people would say Elizabeth Garrett, later Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. And we were delighted to be able to borrow her iconic qualification certificate from the Society of Apothecaries, who allowed her to sit their license exam after she'd been turned down by the college in 1865. But actually, she wasn't the first British woman doctor to qualify in the 19th century. Elizabeth Blackwell, who had been born in Bristol, qualified as a medic in the United States, appeared on the first 1859 medical register in this country. In researching the exhibition, we found that women had been calling themselves doctors for centuries earlier, and we have a copy of a document here from the British Library with Solicitor and Matilda, alongside their brother John, all calling themselves doctors, medicus or medica, Latin for a male or a female doctor. And it was also possible for women to qualify as doctors in the 17th century. And we have a document from Lambeth Palace archives with testimonials from the patients of Elizabeth Moore in the 1690s, saying what a good job that she was doing and recommending through their testimonials that she should be formally registered by the Church of England to be a medical and surgical practitioner. Now, we made the choice to include the story of Dr. James Berry in this exhibition. Now, Berry was an incredibly prominent surgeon in the first half of the, of the 19th century. Um, and when he died, he made explicit instruction that his body should not be examined after death. However, despite this, the woman who prepared his body for burial went to the Victorian press and reported that he had female biological characteristics. And this has led some scholars, including recent biographers, to suggest that he is, in fact, Britain's first female doctor. Um, so we decided to include him in this exhibition, even though he chose to live his life as a man because really we wanted to ask bigger questions around gender and its role in medicine. 
Now, the topic of midwifery really comes to the crux of some of these debates around gender and medicine, because, of course, midwifery was a specialty of medicine traditionally dominated by women. Men wouldn't have even been allowed in the birthing chamber for hundreds of years. But that all started to change in about the middle of the 18th century with man midwives or accoucheurs like William Hunter. And his mentor, William Smelly, at about that same time, had created a development of the forceps, um, his Smelly forceps, which allowed uh, the traditional practice of midwifery to become something more like surgery, um, introducing these tools, uh, sort of manly tools, into the birthing chamber. But not to say that women midwives took this change lying down. Um, prominent practitioners like Elizabeth Nihal wrote out against the use of forceps, saying they were dangerous to mother and baby, likely to set up infection, and that they were unhygienic. But despite this, the, the practice of obstetrics and gynecology became very male-dominated well into the 20th century. In fact, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists didn't get their first female president until 1949. Should we look at gender norms a bit more? We wanted to explore gender norms, the perceptions and expectations about what was normal and natural for women, particularly working in medicine. And one of the things that we wanted to look at was the expectation and the perception that women were not working, when in fact that's just that they're not appearing in the formal records. And uh, they are there working within a family business with surgeons, with apothecaries, with physicians. And an example we have in the case is Susan Lyons, who appears in the records of the college and also of the Society of Apothecaries, being asked to carry on the business as a widow and bring her second husband up to the expected standard of practice. She was clearly an expert medicinal woman. In the 19th century, it wasn't expected. In fact, it was frowned upon for women to be able to have any kind of intimate medical discussion with a male doctor. And so we have a fascinating object here in the case known as a diagnostic or a modesty doll, which is a figure that could be taken by a female patient into a clinic for an appointment with a male doctor so that she could point at the figure um, to describe where her ailment lay rather than actually having to undress or refer to her own body. And that, of course, is a massive challenge for the first women doctors. If it's seen as immodest for them to have male patients, where do they go? And, of course, the majority of them in that first generation um, start with both women and with child patients. I think this is my favourite part of the whole exhibition. Yeah, it's mine too. Because we get to talk about the suffragettes. And something we really wanted to emphasize in the exhibition was while women were working in a difficult context for many centuries, they weren't just sitting back and letting it happen, they were fighting for change. So this is a section that's about activism, which really starts to come out in the early 20th century. Now, while the first women doctors may have been nervous about stepping outside the bounds of what was seen as natural for women, that starts to change by the early 20th century, and you get some really renegade and even rebellious women doctors. And I was really fascinated by Louisa Guerra Anderson, who's the less or known um, daughter of Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. Now she was also a surgeon and in fact a suffragette surgeon. We have here in the case a letter um, from 1910. She's writing to her boss uh, at the head of the hospital committee letting him know she's about to go on a suffragette action and it's likely that she's going to be imprisoned. But not to worry, she has her rotas covered and her patients will still be looked after. So she's balancing being a political figure but also still a doctor. Now, force feeding is a really important issue when we talk about suffragettes and doctors because women doctors were able to speak out against the horrific practice of force feeding, not just feeling for their fellow women, but asserting themselves as professionals, saying it was dangerous, unhygienic, and unsafe. We have here on the wall a loan that's one of my favorites in the entire exhibition. It's a handkerchief that's been signed by women who were imprisoned in Holloway Prison in 1912, and they went on hunger strike, all of these women. And one of them, you could see at the top here, is Alice Kerr. Now, she was a GP from Liverpool who came down for suffragette action and threw a brick through the window of Harrods and was force-fed as a result of it. Now, this suffragette spirit really carries on in the 20th century, and they're able to bring this attitude to the First World War, where early women doctors showed what they could do and what they could contribute to society. And one of the ways they did this was by founding the Endell Street Military Hospital here in London to treat wounded soldiers of the First World War. And that was founded by Louisa Garrett Anderson and her partner, Flora Murray. Now, they showed that women surgeons got to operate and treat not only women and children, but also male patients. And this really breaks the boundaries of what women in medicine can do.
If you succeeded in qualifying as a doctor, as a woman at the end of the 19th century, of course the next challenge was what job could you do? And we looked at acceptable spheres, and typically for women doctors, they were the ones that were less acceptable for men, either less well paid, less palatable, um, less enjoyable. And what we find is that one of the areas is working in India. Um, missionary societies sent qualified women British doctors out to India. For example, Ellen Farrer, who went out in the 1890s and spent the rest of her career there. Another area that women moved into was treatment of venereal disease, the London Lock Hospital, which had been well established um, before, in the 1920s, started getting professional medical staff who were women. Or if you were struggling to get into maybe a specialty of medicine, you could always do something like founding your own, which is actually exactly what Cecily Saunders did when she founded the modern hospice movement in the 1960s. We were really clear when we were planning the exhibition that we wanted it to be about as much women working in medicine today as historically. And so we asked current women doctors what they might nominate to go on display in this case. And at the moment, what we have is something that has been lent by Professor Dame Jane Dacre, which is a stethoscope, a traditional symbol of being a physician, but one that has been bejeweled. So it looks very much more feminine. And Jane kept it in her office when she was president here, really just to start conversations. And it's a really good piece mm. To have on show. That's a really good point because the reason why we called it this vexed question is because we wanted to give a sense of that conversation, of that debate, and actually we wanted visitors to get involved in the discussion. And so that is why we built a feedback board so people who came into the exhibition could give us their opinions and just pitch into the story. Um, just to, to have a look at a just a few of the ones we have here. Um, I like this one. We need to stop making assumptions that link competence and gender. And someone else has written here, here on the bottom. One of my favorite ones at the moment is the focus should be on equality, including relating to so roles in society. I am not a lady doctor, I am a doctor. My gender is irrelevant. Mm, interesting. Or this one, actually. Will you put the painting of men back up on the wall when the exhibition is finished? Now that is a really interesting question. Mm. The wall behind us is usually hung with portraits of male physicians and it's one of the major spaces in the college building. And of course for this exhibition we wanted to change that and hang it with pictures of women in medicine. And with funding from the Lord Leonard and Lady Estelle Wolfson Foundation, we've been able to achieve that. But perhaps it shouldn't have been a surprise, given the challenges of research for the exhibition as a whole, that it was actually quite tricky to find a set of paintings, to look in other institutions, to borrow paintings that we could put on show on this wall. Ultimately, really, portraits are about power, they're about visibility, so it's not surprising that it's difficult to piece together that history of, of women in medicine, but I'm really pleased um, with what we were able to draw together to create this kind of dynamic display in the space. I could talk forever about all of these portraits, but I think I'll explain just a few of them for you. Um, so down here at the bottom, the painting that's teal in the background, now that's the portrait of our immediate past president, Professor Dame Jane Dacre, in a portrait that was commissioned for her to celebrate the end of her presidency, and was actually revealed publicly for the first time as a part of this exhibition and it's been inspired by Holbein. On the far sides you can see two gilt paintings and they're portraits of Louisa Garrett Anderson and Flora Murray. And um, so these are two suffragette surgeons who were so important in the early 20th century. They worked together founding hospitals um, in Britain but also abroad during the First World War and they famously founded of course the Endell Street Hospital in Covent Garden in London not far from here. And in the centerpiece, really the crown of, the, of this portrait hang, um, you can see a loan from the Imperial War Museum, and it shows the all-female surgical team operating at Endell Street Hospital in the First World War. And it's an incredible painting. You very rarely see paintings like this of surgeons or doctors at work, but to have it be a completely female team makes such a strong statement about the dynamism of women in medicine throughout history. And it leaves us with a challenge because, of course, all of these portraits, apart from the presidential one, belong to other institutions and are just on loan for the duration of the exhibition. The challenge, of course, is what happens next? Should we hang the male portraits back on this wall? Indeed, or try something completely different. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you, Bryony, for being here with us today and for all of you for joining us on this curator's tour of this vexed question, 500 Years of Women in Medicine. I hope you've enjoyed learning some more about the exhibition. Thank you.